G'day everyone, I'm Wayne Dowson from Wayne Dowson Fine Art. And I'm very pleased to share with you all the latest painting in my Anzac Portrait series. The painting features 90 year old World War II flying instructor, Mr. Fred Mills. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Gosford RSL Club for the use of their executive room. Thanks guys. I've painted Fred with his logbook and you'll hear all about the logbook in part two of Fred's interview. Also featured in Fred's painting is one of his favourite planes, the Beaufort aircraft. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Mr. Fred Mills, part two. When I first started flying, I got and put me backside on the seat of the tiger moth and uh, the whole thing sort of melted around me, you know. I was very happy about that because I thought I was part of the whole machine. And from that day onwards, when I was flying a tiger moth, I thought it was just, I was just part of it, just going all the time. And uh, I could make it practically do anything. I had three force landing, good practice they were. <laughs> They come out of the blue. <laughs> like they like it, keep, keep it pretty sharp. <laughs> the first two were uh, engine stoppages. <laughs> you got no engine, you got nothing. I'm going to talk up or any other one like that. But uh, you have a procedure to follow. And I'd always follow it, and I'd done the right thing. Like we always used to have to practice, practice, and practice. Same as with the aerobatics, same as with, if we were fighting. We had to practice force landing just as much as we did fighting. I was very pleased with myself when I did my first test for an ordinary force landing. I knew this whole flying instructor was a very hard man he was. And he, he, he used to pick some horrible spots for force landings, that was his reputation. So when I went up with him that day, I had a good look around all the time, I was looking everywhere. The only place I could see was a cricket pitch in the middle of it, in the uh, town, or on the edge of the town. Uh, everything was built out otherwise. We couldn't go anywhere, we couldn't go anywhere on this cricket, cricket pitch, you know. Or oh, that or to land somewhere up a street. And I chose not to land up a street. I said, I'll put it in, I'll pop it on the end of the... I said, you know, I'll drop it on the end of the cricket pitch. And he laughed. <laughs> he said, you got to be joking. I said, no. <laughs> so, I, did. <laughs> I didn't drop it. I sat it on the end of the quick pitch and he said, right, I can put the salt on again now and we'll take off. So we only ran about 50 or 100 yards and we flew away again. He said, but that was not a proper full standing. That was, how, uh, that was uh, an instance of uh, learning to do full standing and being tested on. But that was, I remember that quite distinctly in the test. And he came back and he told them it was a very good one. The other two forced landings that you had, where like were they that? at and what happened? Oh, they were all in Benalla, out of Benalla and around Benalla, and they were all in the Tiger Moth. And uh, I was uh, doing aerobatics, practicing aerobatics. Now, uh, practice aerobatics is a different story than just flying straight and level. And aerobatics is actually an application of fighting procedures you've got when you've got an aircraft and two of you having to go at one another and you've got different things you've got to do. But if you happen to push the control column, which is what we call the stick, happen to push at the wrong time sometimes, most of our problem was we had aircraft that had engines with, uh, didn't have uh, any um, inverted carburetors. They just held the carburetors in them. And if you happen to be on your back and you push the stick a bit hard and you to push the nose up, Pushed the petrol down, there, and it flooded the whole of the thing, and you had a complete floodage, and all you got was a dirty armush full of oil and petrol mixed. <laughs> and so then you, and then look over there, you didn't see where you can go. But so naturally, before you started doing any aerobatic practice, you had a good look around to see where you might have to go if anything went wrong. I've got eight different types of aircraft in my logbook, as having flown in them. That was all that was necessary for me to learn to be able to teach to fly anything that was up to four engines. Uh, the Wacket, 
the Ebra China and the Wirawai and the Targa Moth were all single engine aircraft. The Ebra Anson, the Airspeed Oxford, the Beaufort, and the Lancaster were all multi engine aircraft at which I'd had I had done instruction on and shown how to teach people. So could you explain to us, Fred, uh, what it was like to fly in a wear-away? A wear-away is what they call a service flying aircraft. It was one that was a step up from a Tiger Moth. Uh, it was a harder aircraft to fly than a Tiger Moth, much harder. After we got off the Tiger Moth, they had what they call a Wacket trainer, and that was made by Mr Wacket, an Australian, or, or aeronautical architect, and they taught, uh, that was his aircraft. His type of aircraft. Well, if you wanted to fly wheel-wise, you had to fly a at first because it had, uh, they simulated the cockpit. We flew that type of aircraft for quite a while, but it was garbage. It was, I actually flew a, a wacker from Wangaratta to Banala on, on the oil pump and pumping with one hand like this to keep the oil pressure up with one hand so the motor would keep going. Open aircraft, lovely aircraft, beautiful aircraft to fly, lovely and sensitive, terrific near the ground, for which the, the idea is which they were built, because you could fly the aircraft so well and so quickly and change direction very near the ground. So when, that was the idea of it, made them so sensitive. But you had to check on it all the time, because if you took a little step wrong way. You hit something because you're so close to the ground. But they've always been that way. They were good aircraft. They were good. The only other problem with them, they had a um, problem with the uh, balance with their um, petrol tanks between the four wings. They had four separate tanks. If you're doing steep turns at any time and you've got too many turns and all this sort of stuff, a number of things took over. The aircraft was, you, you could easily lose a donk. I lost a donk one day with this and chopped 20, approximately 20 feet off the top of the tree. It was going along nice and steady and the navigator was there, out the back with a big F-24 taking some beautiful photographs of the localities we were trying to photograph. And uh, he said, just give me a little bit more, Fred. Just a little bit more, a little bit more, and that was a little bit more of a turn, which meant that I had to drop the left wing and bring the right one up. But <clears throat> I did this about two or three times, and he said, "What do you?" I said to him, "What do you think now?" He said, "No." He said, "Just one more, and we'll be right." He said, "I just didn't quite get it right." I right, I started on the next one round, and bingo. Uh, the pistol from my right hand tank had the looped across into the others and, and I had no petrol up the top and all down the bottom tanks and a lot of air in the middle and that's where it went straight into the carburetor on that engine. Well, at 200 feet, it's not a nice sensation to find yourself upside down. <laughs> Look, looking at the ground. <laughs> so, what have you got to do to get out of that? The only way to one way to get flying speed, and that is dive the aircraft at the ground. And I did. And I dived it, and I went straight up this creek. And there was this gum tree, a little gum tree, about halfway up. And I took him with me. <laughs> but I got away with it. I pulled it up again and pulled it up straight. And in the meantime, I'm doing this. What made me do it, I don't know. It's training, I suppose. Good training. I pumped like hell on my petrol pump to bring all the petrol pumps up in the correct uh, numbers again. And then our David engine caught, we climbed. But the Bavers were beautiful aircraft near the ground. You could make them almost do anything. They practically spoke to you while you were going along. If you were driving, you wanted to do it, you could do whatever you like with it, as long as you did nice and gentle and feeling, felt what you were doing. And 
Uh, but the main reason why they did so well in uh, our uh, bombing squadrons, I think it was 32 squadrons, they had Beauforts and I'm not sure. But uh, we had to be on Beauforts before you could go on the bow fighters. Bow fighters were our own special aircraft and uh, we loved them so much. And actually, most people don't know it, but from the, the Coral Sea battles onwards, they were the ones that we owe Air Force wise to uh, the fact that Australia have got Japanese masters at the present time. They chopped hell out of the Japanese and they didn't muck about with them either. They did a very, very good job. Do you want to talk to us about your experience with G for George? I was at Tamworth doing a uh, conversion course oh, and the next thing we know we had this visit from Chief of George came in and they told us it was a morale booster and everything and they had it there for two days I think and we allowed each one of the flying instructors in the place to have one hand you could take it off and land it, take it around the dome and it and land it again and we could say then we flying to Chief George uh, during that time of and it boosted the morale quite a lot because it meant we had some. Well, we've been up as instructors. We've been able to get our hands on something and been doing some real good. Fred, can you tell us about how you met your beautiful wife, Penny? Uh, I was actually at Sale, and we had gone into Ben's house for a dance this night. And on a Saturday night, because there was no television those days, and uh, we were standing in it as a group of men and in it, groups of girls, and it was always the way. And uh, so, with normal protocol, I said to this chap that was with the group that I was with, I didn't know him much, I said, do you know any of those girls over there? And he said, yep. I said, what about that little doll on the left hand side? He said, yes. He said, she actually comes on leave and stays at our place. I said, oh, what's her name? She's Penny Walsh. She was a wireless operator from the Air Force. So I got him to give me an introduction. They only had 12 WAFs. Penny was one of them. And uh, in that particular area, they were the only ones in the RAAF that were allowed to do certain type of uh, signals work. And they actually used to take it in turns on their leaves to supervise the, the blips, as we call them. They were little noises that the Navy gave out, and we used to go, if we were going on a long run somewhere, this little blip come up every now and then and it let them know that where we were and what we were doing. She did actually, her and one other mate actually saved my life one night. Uh, we were doing an exercise, it was called Dead Reckoning. The particular night we went out, there were 15 aircraft went out and it was over the Sea of Bass Strait, right northern Tasmania, all out down there and right out over the sea. The level was uh, 1,500 feet, with a low cloud when we went out and when we came back it got down to about 200 or 100 feet and it was real stormy, windy conditions and uh, so we were in, all of us were in deep trouble and uh, when I started to come back through it uh, I said, oh well, I'm going to do what they call a QGH approach, it was a special type of approach we used to practice on instrument flying all the time, it meant you had a certain pattern you flew once you found that one. Once they heard where you were, they only just had to get a blip on you. But you had to have someone on the other end, at the bottom, to talk to you all the way through it as you were going, show you different directions as you went across the top. And uh, so Penny happened to be the one that was doing it. Twelve out of the fifteen crews that flew, we either had very badly damaged the whole of the crew or lives. And I think we lost about five or six lives that night. Just for practice. I kept on going with Penny. Next time she said, we got on quite well together. We went on a few steak parties and we had to book a couple more times as anybody does. Uh, I didn't have the time when they get out together. And uh, we were both hot and red blooded. <laughs> and uh, so he said, right, let's get near the end of the war. Why worry? Why don't we get married? And the girls all there and everything had to be done with coupons those days. Wedding dresses, the whole lot. Everything had to be done with coupons. All the girls, all the mates put in their coupons and all through it. We had a wonderful wedding. Fred, I just want to ask you about the Air Force motto. 
you were talking about it earlier. The Air Force motto is per ardua ad astra. That always impressed me. First time I noticed it was the day I went in the was joined up in front of me on the flag in Wilmanu. I had Pudadua Adastra and I wiped and I found out later on what it meant. It actually meant Pudadua meant through hardship, Adastra meant to the stars. Pudadua Adastra meant through hardship to the stars. Thank you so much Fred for sharing your story with us. Now there's just one last question that I wanted to ask you and that was about your logbook. This logbook was given to me as my normal logbook as I was flying but after I had been at uh, Tamora for a, a, quite a while uh, I seemed to have an affinity for getting on the staff alright and uh, one day as a present then the girls came in and saw me from the parachute section and they said, we'd like to give you a present. And I said, what's that? And they said, we'd like to, if we can get your logbook, we'd like to put a, a cover on it for you, made of parachute silk. Now this is made of the actual parachute silk that was used in the making of the wings on a Tiger Moth aircraft. And it's one of the things that I really uh, do treasure in my life. And that was a treasure. And it came from the heart of the girls who were there who did the job very well. Thank you.